So let me share my screen real quick. Perfect. Uh, yeah, so I hope you can, you can share my screen. Um, so yeah, welcome to Multimodal Weekly. This is a webinar series uh, hosted by the team at Tor Labs. I think most, most of you are new to the webinar, so probably want to do a quick introduction about, about it. So, um, you know, uh, we uh, hosted by Tor Labs, and we've been, you know, running this webinar series uh, every single Friday over the past, you know, one year or so. And some of the topics that we tend to cover on a weekly basis include uh, news research in multimodal AI and production models, uh, innovative application multimodal in different verticals. Uh, since we focus a bit on video understanding, sometimes we have our team members, uh, like community members, talk about the video and you know um, adjacent multimodal projects that they work on. And finally, uh, we have team members who like just talk about the tutorials and guys and using our platform and API. Um, in some of the you know recent uh, session of multimodal weeklies, uh, we, as you can see, we have quite a diverse persona right, from our partners, you know, applying uh, video understanding in real application in healthcare and like you know, media to like, you know, researchers um, doing things like evaluating partnership models, uh, bringing multimodal to uh, the, the domain of audio and, you know, um, speech and et cetera. Yeah. So uh, along that team, you know, today's session will focus on the research side. I think, you know, I, I definitely want to have more and more like researchers working uh, at the forefront of the field to to come to our webinar and, you know, share some of the work that they do from an academic perspective. So um, the first speaker uh, is Lei Tian Fu, also, also go by Max, and he's currently a PhD student at UC Berkeley, and he will talk on uh, a learning touch vision language uh, for multimodal perception. And I think this is the basis of um, his work on the uh, TVL uh, data set, touch vision language data set that aim to align all these three modalities. Right? Um, and then on uh, the second half of the webinar, we'll have uh, Dr. Bo Zhao, currently a principal investigator at the Beijing Academy of um, Artificial Intelligence. And he will give a talk on uh, a series of you know, open source, um, lightweight multimodal LLMs called Bunny. And this is pretty really exciting work because it it um um gonna emphasize like you know the rise of uh, small but efficient uh multimodal foundation models right so yeah definitely curious to uh, to hear about the design and like the development of, and as well as the uh, evaluation of how it works um yeah so um if you have any question feel free to just put it on the zoom chat and uh you know, uh, after each speaker finish, we'll have more um, like a formal Q and A, maybe anywhere between five ten minutes uh, for any live question, uh, just to make it more interactive. So with that, uh, I'll stop sharing my screen and uh, yeah, I'll let Max. Do you wanna unmute and uh, you know start sharing your screen? Go ahead with your part. Great, I'm seeing. Awesome. Awesome. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Okay, that's good. Um, so yeah, thanks, James. Uh, and also, like, please feel free to interrupt, like, if you have any questions throughout the presentation. I I like to do this like more of a lively presentation, <laughs> even though it's a bit online. So I'm Max. Uh, I'm a PhD student at Berkeley AI Research under Professor Ken Goldberg. Today, I'm excited to present to you our most recent work on multimodal alignment. This is joint work with Gaurav, Raven, Will, Jamin, Joey, Mustafa, Mike, Roberto, and Ken, and it's a collaboration with Meta and Hugh Dresden. So I'm pretty sure if I ask everyone in this hypothetical room uh, which of these they would like to pet, and you would all say the bunny, but not the sea urchin. Um, we would like to describe the sea urchin as pointy and hurtful, and we won't associate these kind of description with the bunny because it looks very soft. So how do we achieve this as human beings? Um, as kids, we gather data that is quite multimodal as we interact with the world around us. Um, there's a lot of visual, proprio, um, audio, tactile data that are gathered concurrently from all of our sensing modalities. Cross-modal supervision is quite common in our daily life. Since early childhood, we learned through um, shared modality of vision and touch, and then further, describe or listen to other describing their tactile experiences, which provide automatic self-supervision 
about the physical world. So in this case, if we are presented with a scissor, then our parents will probably tell us that we shouldn't play with sharp scissors, and we know that a scissor is sharp. So in the vision and language community, there is a lot of vision and language models or multimodal models, which can generally be categorized into two types. One learns a joint representation between language and other modalities exemplified by a clip uh, image bind. And the other learns a generative model based on language model or diffusion model. Some examples of these are GPT-4V, Lava, Flamingo, Blip, just to name a few. However, touch as one of the core sensing modality of human embodiment is always missing in this multimodal conversation until this year. Um, there's a lot of new works that have been popping out, um, especially since like January, and I'm super excited about this direction. So when we look at these previous existing foundation models, while well, they can perform certainly like high level reasoning tasks, generate photorealistic images and demonstrate capabilities that many specialist models are not capable of doing, they're still somewhat detached from like the physical world that we live in today. I say rely on a few modalities, like very few modalities, in fact, language, images, and video in particular. Um, so however, when we think about human interaction with the physical world, we use a lot more modalities that come with a human embodiment. Some of these embodied data that allows us um, or like help us with um, understanding the physical world include touch, audio, and proprioception. And I think which, of, uh, of which these modalities are more commonly found in like large video data sets or like robot data sets. So there are a lot of work we can reference from the robotics community where embodied multimodal data, especially like tactile data, is gathered and used in a diverse data set of them, like for downstream tasks. Yeah. Is there any questions or? Okay. Yeah. Early, early works that use tactile for perceiving like cloth textures or for grasping or slip detection. And more recent work use tactile to estimate where the sensor is touching the object um, or run self-supervised pre-training to find like touch and vision association or use some sort of a combination of vision and touch to perform industrial uh, insertion or like in-hand rotation. Oh More closely related to what uh, is going to be presented today are works on touch-based perception or how touch is associated with object texture or more generally natural language description of surfaces. Many existing work worked on texture and cost classification. However, these data are collected in lab or very controlled environment, um, which is kind of limited. In contrary, children touches almost everywhere which allows us to develop a more general sense of touch. So let's see more recent work such as touch and go, like we have seen like a movement towards data collection in the wild. However, in all of like most of these cases, um, tactile inputs are only associated with a very limited set of classes and cannot refine, uh, like reflect the fine grained nature of touch. So in this project, we seek to associate touch with open vocabulary descriptions. Um, in addition, we kind of want to ask the question of whether it is like possible to have a model that is capable of handling both touch and vision input and generate freeform descriptions of touch instead of limiting to a very like small set of data, a very small set of class. So we developed the following framework. We first developed a touch vision language data set by collecting touch and vision data in the wild then perform multimodal alignment on the data set so that touch can be aligned with both the visual and language inputs. Um, this allows us to perform vision and touch conditional generation um, in the sense of generating text, enable the model to describe for them for how surface feel like in natural language. So um, instead of like starting with like directly on a new data set, we start with an existing data set from our labs prior work. Um, which is called like self-supervised visual tactile pre-training or SSBTP. SSBTP is a data set collected by laying a lot of random objects on the surface, um, especially like the cloth closes, uh, some industrial objects like wrenches. Um, also we have scissors, um, but yeah, these objects are generally laying on like a flat surface and the robot is tasked to touch random locations on this surface. 
Um, this result in a vision and touch aligned data set where like the touched part is directly at the center of the visual input. Given this data set, we provide the labeler or ourselves with a list of 500 words to describe the texture, um, the RGB image and the tactile image. And then we will label the image touch pair with natural language labels. Um, note that the vocabulary is only used for guidance, like 400 words is only used for guidance. We're not like limited to the description that's being used on this list. And we're like, sort of encouraged to compose multiple adjectives together to describe or better describe the surface. For example, given this image above, we will list it as like fabric and bumpy. So from this process, we got like 4.6 thousand human annotations on the SSVTP data set. Um, but compared to like most of the data sets that we have in today's world is quite small. So to further expand the data set and to collect truly like in a wild data, we developed a device that is capable of like synchronizing vision and touch input. Um, and then the, the way we have this device is that uh, we have this handheld device where we have like the digit tactile sensor on one end and we have a Logitech real webcam on the other end and we can manually like adjust the tilt of the Logitech Brio. So we have like a bit of visual randomization. And then both of these streams are collected synchronously. So yeah, you can, you can have a better visual of like what the multimodal sensors are um, as they're drawn out in this particular figure. Um, so to create sufficient diversity in terms of the data set we collect, um, we try to capture such via like multiple different motions, such as like pressing and sliding. And sometimes we do have a little bit of twist um, so that we can have like sufficient diversity also at the tactile aspect, like tactile modality. So here we provide a few examples of the motion and observations we have collected in this data set. In particular, now we have like diverse foreground and background objects compared to like existing data sets and also a synchronized vision and touch Duration, which is kind of similar to touching. Yeah, so from this device, we have collected 213,000 image and touch pairs. Some of the examples of image and touch pairs are listed above, but it's going to be quite annoying to label all of these data, and some parts of these data are not in contact, and which we weren't super sure whether they were useful or not. So we first want to design a process to somehow like process and filter this data set. So to filter this data set, we first try to understand what is in contact, what is not. Um, this will help with further like downstream labeling because we only want to label the parts that are be like in contact and just make everything else like not in contact. Um, so we use a tactile encoder that is trained in the previous work, like the, in the F3GP work. Empirically, we use the threshold to, of like 0 0.6 to determine whether the tactile image is in contact or not. Um, and then just to clarify like why this method may be better than like some baseline methods such as like image differencing, um, because like image differencing like in our experience is super conservative. There's also like situations where the tactile patterns is not super obvious, like especially when you're pressing on a very flat surface or like some wood surface. It's not super obvious via image difference in like how much of that difference can be captured. And there's a lot of like false negatives. So this is why we opt for like using the other method, which is like use the tactile encoder and calculate the latent space consumption. So given that it will take a tremendous amount of time and human effort to label the entire data set, we thought of a, an alternative, which is ask or prompt GP4B with the visual observations and query it for tactical feelings. Um, and this becomes a super fast process and resulting roughly like 39,000 image tactile pairs that are usable. The other ones GP4B just reject or like doesn't want to generate a tactile description. So these two data sets or subsets combined uh, to form the, our entire training set. And it roughly contains um, 44 to 45,000 image. And then one more note that I want to clarify on the data set is that it's kind of similar to ImageNet and, and some other like large data sets as well. 
this data set exhibits, exhibits long tail distributions, which makes normal um, mo like multi class classification scheme fairly challenging. Uh, so this is why we want to generate like free form language instead of like doing multi class classification for tactile um, sensations. So yeah, so this is some something that like if we want to use this data set, it will be good to know. So now we have the data set. Uh, we show a discriminative and a generative task um, and their corresponding model that this data set over. And the first thing we want to do is generate a discriminative model, and then we can then use this discriminative model to run the downstream generation. So we took reference from existing multimodal alignment works, namely clip and image find. Both of these approaches formulate alignment uh, with the contrastive learning objective. So similar to these works, we encode the text and the vision data via clip, uh, and they are frozen during the entirety of the training. For each batch, we pick all combinations, so touch vision, vision language, language touch, and perform pairwise contrastive learning. And then all of these three contrastive loss are then averaged um, to, like, to run back propagation, and then we learn the encoder. This is quite different from ImageFind, as ImageFind binds everything only to vision. Um, an equivalent formulation of this is to discard the text data or like the text touch loss or the language touch loss and only run the tactile vision loss along with like the vision language. So we then present a generative model that tries to describe the tactile sensation from vision and touch. We align the vision and touch input to the language model in two stages. In the first stage, a lightweight projector is trained to inject the vision and tactile inputs into the language model. In this stage, uh, we train the model using the TL dataset and conceptual caption. A lot of these like training methodologies are described in um, a very interesting work, in my opinion, uh, which is called like ImageBind LLP. And then that is a work that kind of fuses ImageBind and then bind it into like, their Llama adapter formulation. And I find this to be fairly helpful when running this integration. So in the, in the second stage, um, we fine tune the model with a TVL data set, a language only data set, and then a vision language data set. So namely, we use like the Alpaca data set, um, the, Lava, the Lava Instruct 150,000 data set, along with like the TVL data set to, to do this fine. Um, and then during this stage of fine tuning, we like use LoRa to um, like essentially like unfreeze our Llama 2 model. So we evaluate the two models uh, via two tasks. First, we want to run the retrieval task where we match this tactile input with uh, vision or language inputs. And we then do a generative task where um, the alignment to which the model offers is tested on the correctness of the generated text or description um, for the tactile feeling. So in the TVL classification benchmark, we find that adding more tactile data does help with generalization to different tactile sensors and visual inputs. So if we only train on SS3TP, um, the performance on like the general large like TVL data set is pretty bad. But if we use like a larger data set, then this distribution is captured. And then if we only align tactile to vision, then the accuracy will probably be upper bounded by vision text alignment. This result suggesting that by leveraging human and pseudo labels, we can align tactile with language descriptions um, slightly better than just having like vision touch alignment overcoming this bottleneck. So to further clarify uh, this hypothesis, as this is a quite a critical one, um, because ImageFind uses this, we run an experiment without the tactile text loss, which mirrors the setup in ImageFind, where every modality is binded to vision, but not to each other. And then we find that by using the pairwise loss across all three modalities, um, the tactile text loss, uh, or the tactile text alignment improves, which means that it's quite important to use pseudo labels so that we can have like all three losses or do like every pair, like pairwise modality. We additionally update on like model architecture, training the model on like 
few pairs of modality and then many other ablations for more details, please refer to the paper. Um, so now we can then talk about like the generation benchmark. The generation benchmark started by giving vision and touch input to multimodal model to generate a response on the texture. Then given human labeled ground truth, GPT-4 is asked to rate the output of the models respectively. Then a pair sample t-test is conducted for each model against a score achieved by GPT-4V, the model that where the pseudo label is generated on the data set. By training on a combination of human and GPT-4V pseudo labels, we find that TVL Llama, the proposed model, outperforms it, uh, its existing vision language model. And more interestingly, GPT-4V and its pseudo label. We also provide a baseline, which is uh, we have the vision encoder pre-trained known as BTP alone, and we find that it's not sufficient. Um, we have to train on this entire data set to get like improved results. So here we present a few interesting examples of how the model will perform the test set. Um, in this example, most of the models, especially the more recent ones, perform fairly well. Um, in this situation where um, there's confounding signal in vision, even like after cropping, GP4 fails to capture the surface condition because the, the background is technically flat as a cardboard, but there's like specular um, artifacts on the surface or specular visual artifacts on the surface. Um, on the other hand, TVL Lama is able to make the correct prediction. In this case as well, because the visual observation, like it's very hard to see what the sensor is touching, GPT-4V incorrectly describes the texture. There are also like still failure cases. There's an example where the model doesn't generate the correct description. Like this tactile sensor, you have to bring me on this as it is in contact with the stone, but like uh, or, or the coral reef, but um, the, the model does not generate like the descriptions or tactile descriptions. So there's still quite a lot of limitations to the proposed method. The data collection setup is prone to self-occlusion, which can result in incorrect pseudo labels. It would be good to resolve that. Um, in addition, when we record, like we record the vision and tactile videos, but neither a model or, um, or neither models, this model like the dynamics or the time aspect in the data set. And then we hope that future work can further resolve. So the code data set checkpoints are all released and then you can scan the QR code on the right to um, obtain them. Uh, thanks for listening to the presentation and then I'll open the floor to Q&A. Awesome, yeah. Uh, thanks, Max. This is a like, super comprehensive presentation that cover a lot of things. And I'm sure like, I think the audience pretty appreciate uh, you going over automated technology as well as uh, the results and, and limitations as well. Um, yeah, so, um, you know, attendees, if you have any questions, please either unmute yourself or just put on the chat. Um, yeah. Hi, Max. Uh, I have a question. So, uh, when, yep. uh, so in, in some images issue, that I find that the, the tactile map and the v, the image, the, the corresponding image doesn't match very well. So uh, if, if you, uh, so I, it, it mean, I mean, I mean, I can't identity, for example, uh, object in the tactile map, if we just uh, uh, watch it slowly, uh, so, uh, so. Are you referring to this one or? No, if you go, uh, to previous further back, uh, yeah, back like this one, uh, yeah, yeah. If you uh, see, uh, yeah, I, so when I watch the tactile map, I can't identity, uh, I can't distinguish uh, two different uh, tactile Im images. Oh yeah, so uh, because these are like video streams, um, so like at the beginning of the data collection, the sensor is always not in contact. So I think like if you just compare like for them for the first two, or maybe it's because of like zoom, 
um, I think it will be better shown as like these are actual videos. So okay. like, but, but to clarify, like the videos themselves, um, like in the middle of the video sequences, they do show the tactile oh, variations yeah. or like, yeah. But like in the beginning or the end of the video sequence, because the device is not in contact with the with the object of interest, then oh, like no signal will be shown. Um, this is also why we want to do like this this filtering process. Right? Like if we have this filtering process and we can know like precisely where or like hopefully we know precisely where the tactile observations is like in fact in contact with the object that we want to watch instead of like any background tactile images. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Great. Um, so on the note about the data set collection, I think you mentioned the uh, efficiency of using GPT 4 v for serial labeling, right? Um, yeah. Is, is that, yeah, it's like I think one of the previous slides you said there's like two thousand. This one? Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, like, yeah, maybe like, how much time does it have, uh, like, times being saved, right? Compared to, like, mm -hmm. say, um, other, other uh, human an annotation, right? Uh, man manual labeling, and, yeah. Yeah, so I think um, the amount of time is saved is probably around 5x. Yeah, so I think for GP4B, like, we, Branded like in roughly 12 hours per batch. And then we have like three or four batches. Um, because the, the problem with GP4V, in fact, is that like sometimes it will generate like no labels. Mm -hmm. uh, it will say that I, I don't want to generate a label for this image operation. It's like too obscure. Mm -hmm. um, and then some other times, because like, as like we are in academic settings, we don't have like super high bounds for like GPT-4V tokens. So like after like a few hours, it will just run out. Like um, we reach the upper number of like query requests for GPT-4V. And then that is sort of why we are like bottlenecks for running on this entire data set in one go, but we have to run it in like practice. Um, but yeah, I think it's like on the order of like probably three days at most to generate the, all the pseudo labels mm -hmm. because of the, the reasons I provided. Um, on the other hand, like the 4.6 taking annotations, there are extreme cases where like we probably can do this under like 24 hours if we have like sufficient number of like, people, but uh, we kind of also like went through them slowly. So we probably also took around like three or four days to generate these. So it really de depends on like what kind of environmental constraints you are at. Like if you have a lot of people, then it will be ideal to run like human annotations because they're definitely more precise than GP4V. But like also like if you don't have like super high bounds on like the number of tokens you can access for, for open AI, it mm -hmm. will be also good to run GP4V. Um, so there's sort of like a trade-off given how much resource you have. Got it. Yeah. And um, back to the discriminative model, um, you know, um, TVL encoder, right? And I think that's what slide you. Yeah, this, I think you highlight here the modality alignments, right? Uh, clips, backbone clip for text and visual encoder, then the tactile encoder. I think this is a, like from a previous work, right? Um, that, yeah. you know, that represent tactile data, right? And um, the, the way you- so this, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I guess just to clarify, this tactile encoder is quite different from the previous tactile encoder. Uh, so previously, I think they were using like ResNet 18, which is like quite low in terms of capacity. Mm -hmm. In this one, we try to update on like all three sizes of VIT, like VIT tiny, VIT S, and VIT base. So architectural wise, they are like slightly different, but generally, I think the training scheme should be more or less the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
and I think you mentioned something around like pairwise contrast contrastive loss when you concatenate these like three yeah. modality um, mm -hmm. embeddings right into the same latent space, right? Yeah. So in terms of like pairwise contrastive loss, like for the previous work, there's only like vision and touch data. So there can be only like vision and touch pairwise contrastive loss. Here we have like tactile vision, tactile text, and vision text. Mm -hmm. We have like all three losses. Perfect. Yeah. Um, I think final question I have is on the TVL um, Lama, right? The uh, this the auto regressive model, and you mentioned you mm -hmm. you do supervised tuning, right, on Apaka and the Lava instruction tuning dataset. Um, yeah. To like so, to, to make the decoder, this... yeah, to make the decoder component more adaptable when it generates yeah. the, the output. Yeah, that, that's correct. So like in, in terms of like the training scheme, like um, it's kind of similar to most of the prior works, I would say at this point, mm -hmm. you do like multimodal alignment. The first one is that the projection layer has to be first trained, mm -hmm. uh, like it can take in visual inputs and somehow you know, with visual inputs super well. So in that stage, like we have the conceptual captions data set um, and our data set. And then in the second stage, both the um, projection layer and Llama to itself are frozen. We only like fine tune the lower the language model. Um, and then, yeah, we use like Alpaca operators in our data set. Yeah. Any reason for Llama 2? Did you consider any other like open source LLM? At that time, I think like Llama 2 is a one that we think will work. Um, I mean, we also have like Llama 1 um, that is possible. And then we just didn't have time to try these. <laughs> we just went straight to like Llama 2. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, it'd be cool if you like, you know, maybe you try out like- Yeah, yeah, to update on these. Like one of these, like, I don't know. But I think I'm not sure there's a bunch of model which we will talk about um, soon. Um, well, yeah, I think that's that's all, all the question I have. Uh, thanks, Max, for you know the, the in depth uh, yeah. coverage of, of you know your work and the relevant um, details. I think this is super interesting, especially like for for me and for Twelve as well, because we also work in both like you know discriminative model for the show yeah. and, and generic model. So I think it's kind of similar to what what you propose here with the um, TV encoder and TV llama. Great. Um, so yeah, that's Bo, it. you wanna go ahead and. Uh, and mute and share screen. Uh, I think, um, yeah, multimodal LMs. So I think, yeah, um, there's a lot of relevant stuff that that you present. Maybe, you know, touch on kind of what Max just um, talked about as well. Yeah. Okay. Let me show my screen. Hi guys. Uh, can you see my screen? Yep. I saw it. Okay. Okay. Uh, thanks, James. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm going to present our set works about uh, efficient uh, and uh, effective multimodal large language models. Uh, I'm now a principal investigator at uh, Beijing Academic of uh, Artificial Intelligence, and I'm now, uh, before I bef before I ob obtained my PhD degree from the University of Edinburgh, I'm now working on multimodal large language models and uh, data centric AI. Um, so the first work is uh, SVIT, the scaling up visual instruction tuning. So this work is uh, this work uh, was uh, done in uh, in May twenty twenty three. So when we saw the lava, uh, the the uh, multi, uh, the the vision language model comes out come out, we find that it's a visual instruction tuning dataset is quite small. It's just like one hundred and fifty thousand. Training samples, so we try. Uh, we we think it's too too small to to you know to train a good vision language model. So we try to construct a big one, a million scale vision instruction training dataset. So we use the visual genome. A uh, dataset consists of uh, many images and uh, also 
a, a lot of human uh, manually annotated uh, descriptions. Although those descriptions are very short, for example, they just describe uh, a, a specific person in the image or, uh, or just uh, the relationship between the image and the car. So uh, they, are not sent uh, they are not a complete sentence. So we use the GPT-4 to um, reconstruct the visual genome uh, manual annotations and uh, generate those uh, com uh, complete conversations, complex reasoning question answers and uh, referring question answers. So in total, we generated like 4 million uh, QA pairs for training, uh, for, for training models. And this is the first large uh, medium scale vision instruction training data set, and it has been a uh, source. So uh, many recent works use uh, the data from this uh, uh, this source, and they construct their own data set by selecting or choosing some uh, choosing some samples from this SVIT data set. Here is some takeaway. So when we uh, uh, we so we can leverage. Uh, efforts in previous work, we know uh, that there are a lot of vision data sets that are constructed before. However, they are not uh, in the format um, for training large language models or vision language models. So we can reconstruct it by uh, reforming, reformatting this uh, previous data sets. The signal takeaway is that uh, synthetic data is as effective as uh, real training data. So, uh, now it is a uh, common sense. So a lot of data sets, especially uh, those vision instruction data sets, they are constructed by, by, by prompting the GPT for GPT or other open source language model, open source vision language models to uh, generate such kinds of synthetic data. They even works better than the real training data because we can synthesize as a no, as uh, as long as possible. So we find that the long uh, training data, for example, the long descriptions, the very detailed descriptions, can be more efficient for training models. Okay, the second work is a bunny, a concise open source lightweight MLM. So why do we build bunny? When we try to use uh, of tuning the lava. We find that the code is not very user friendly, so we and we need a, a concise experiment base. So we try to build our own uh, uh, multi uh, our own multi model large language model. Uh, then we uh, then we believe that the increasing the model parameters is not necessary, and um, while improving the data quality is more important. We we believe that the model performance is. Uh, model performance relies on the data quality, the training data quality, instead of the model premise. This is also verified by the Microsoft uh, Phi model series. So uh, they use, uh, they, they keep uh, proposing new small uh, language models. So after the Phi model was proposed, we uh, we based, uh, we we build our bounty based on their like uh, their Phi. By two model. Here is the structure. So we use a flexible model structure. Here we have a vision encoder. It it uh, has a lot of alternatives. For example, the Eva clip, the Siglip. So we 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 choose those very uh, uh, lightweight uh, vision encoders. Uh, for for example, here the Siglip is just like four hundred million parameters. And uh, then we have a large language model with uh, LoRa uh, parameters. We choose some lightweight light, large language models such as Phi, Stable LM, and uh, and uh, the Llama like 8B. So our code, uh, uh, so our so our uh, bunny can uh, can it, it can be uh, so it's very easy to replace. This uh, vision encoders or large language um, bases with the uh, the new the new coming uh, uh, fundamental foundation models. Then is the uh, 
uh, uh, then is the data ship. So we we believe the training data is the most important part for training a good uh, vision language model. So we uh, for the pre-training we use we construct a line two two million. The line two million is a, a selected samples from line two B. No, line two B has two billion samples. So we use some core set selection method to select uh, those two million uh, course, uh, important samples. The specific, uh, the, the, the detailed selection algorithm can be found in our uh, GitHub repo. Then for the fine tuning data, we construct a bunny fine tuning data. This data set is constructed by replacing uh, some subsets in the lava mix 665K. So we, we do ablation study to choose the best subset and then uh, combine combine them. Here are some demonstrations of the of the bunny. We we have an online uh, demonstration platform, so uh, everyone can use it. Uh, for example, here uh, for this interesting image, the, the right one, a man is a. Uh, uh, drinking the beer in on the moon, uh, it, and we the our bunny can re reason that uh, this image is not real because uh, uh, no man can drink beers on the moon, and this is not a very uh, typical mission in the space. In the right image, we can see that it's a very busy street, and our bunny can reason that uh, this image is taken in Hong Kong. Uh, based on those characters uh, in the image. And uh, we, uh, it can also tell us uh, the some traffic signs. For example, here the vans can only uh, run between 7 a.m. and uh, midnight. So our bunny has a very good uh, OCR or uh, visual grounding ability. Here are some Chinese uh, 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 cases. We know that uh, uh, those uh, Five uh, Lama models are trained mainly on the English uh, data. So their Chinese ability is uh, usually uh, not as good as the English. So we, uh, our, we, we find that uh, just uh, fine tuning on a, sm a, a little Chinese data, its uh, Chinese performance is also very, uh, is also set, already satisfying. Here are more examples to show that our model can have a very good uh, like common sense about uh, you know, uh, popular uh, celebrities, popular like arts. And uh, the model can understand some uh, humor. And uh, uh, the model can understand uh, and solve uh, simple mathematical problems. Here is the Pomerce leaderboard. Uh, so in the popular, the MM bench leaderboard, with uh, our bunny Lama can uh, uh, take the 12th place. It, uh, it, uh, it outperforms the GPT-4 uh, in the last uh, uh, 11, uh, sorry, sorry in, in the last November. The right figure shows the, the performance comparison between the GPT-4, the latest uh, version GPT-4. So in these benchmarks, we, we, see, we find that our bunny 8B can achieve a, about 87% performance of GPT-4. Um, so our bunny is only 8 billion parameters. This is another leaderboard. So compared to those, uh, Lightweight uh, uh, competitors, so our bunny can still have, have still have a very good performance in different benchmarks. So the next is some ablation study. We show that uh, uh, here. Uh, so in this table, the table two it shows that uh, uh, LoRa training, uh, LoRa training is better than fully training. The possible reason that the uh, visual instruction tuning data set is still small, so 
And if we fully tuning the model, it will cause a forgetting problem. The, the model will forget the previous uh, uh, language knowledge. And uh, the, it, especially it will damage its uh, cognition ability. Here is a, um, a, a more com complex ablation study about the, the model examining image increasing image size and the data receipt and uh, also the uh, tuning strategies. So the general conclusion is that uh, uh, if we do model examining, it works. And the uh, increase image size can improve the performance. Besides, uh, in, uh, inclu include more diverse data, uh, instruction tuning data. It uh, can improve the performance. And uh, uh, if we like turn the vision encoder, it, uh, it uh, works better than free, free uh, freeze, freezing the encoding, the vision encoding. So I, I will not uh, like uh, describe uh, every ablation study. If you are interested, you can refer to our paper. And the last uh, ablation study is about uh, the language model. So we find that the language model is the most important part for the uh, vision language model. Um, uh, this, uh, this is uh, uh, straightforward. This conclusion is straightforward. So here, uh, when the new la language model comes out, we will uh, uh, quickly adapt uh, to them, and uh, we can find the uh, for the same vision encoder, and the performance uh, increases when the new language model comes out. Right. Okay. So here are some other findings. First, uh, the Perception and cognition performance will influence each other. It means when we try to, you know, uh, turn the high, high parameters to, to to try to increase the one ability, for example, the perception, the visual perception, usually it will uh, damage the cognition performance. So they have a a, a balance between them. The the second one is that. Uh, Model example usually get better results. This is very interesting. Uh, we, we know that a model example works in traditional small models. Um, for last language models, we find that it still works. The third one is that training data is more important, is the most important. And um, this is this also has been like uh, uh, verified in last language models. We find that uh, uh, now even the five, three, four B uh, models can work much better than previous, like a thirty B, thirteen B, or even larger sixty B models. So, uh, generally speaking, the training data is more important instead of the parameters. Uh, so the in the following uh, slides, I will briefly introduce our recent works. Uh, uh, about the last young model in some other applications, for example, the medical image analysis. Here we constructed a large uh, 3D medical training data set. This data set uh, consists of uh, 120,000 CT reports and pairs and uh, 600,000 instruction tuning data pairs. So this instruction tuning data is also generated by GPT-4 with the original CT and report pairs. So this is uh, based on the constructed data set, then we can train a 3D medical MLM. And uh, this is the first one that can implement eight tasks in with one model, including the report generation, visual question answering, and uh, segmentation and detection. If you are interested in this uh, medical task, you can uh, check it in our GitHub rep and uh, our models and uh, uh, data are open source. Here is a demonstration. We have a video. So with just one model, we can here, for example, to uh, let it generate reports based on a 3D CT. Uh, we can ask uh, the medical questions or we can implement the detection task. And we can implement the segmentation. Okay. 
the last work I want to introduce is uh, the uh, benchmark. So recently we comp we construct a benchmark for evaluating the long video understanding. The previous ones uh, usually just uh, evaluate uh, the previous benchmarks just uh, evaluate uh, short videos. Their task designs are only for short videos, and uh, and their video uh, videos are usually with very specific uh, uh, category and the tasks. So there, it lacks such kinds of benchmark to evaluate long view no, videos. <laughs> Here is the statistics of the questions in this benchmark. Uh, generally speaking, uh, we, uh, our videos have an average length of 12 mi mi minutes. And we also have very long uh, videos. Uh, those have over two, 100 mi minutes. The, the videos uh, uh, have uh, diverse categories. And uh, we also design different uh, tasks, including those uh, action count, action odd, uh, video summary, uh, or need a question answer. We, uh, we uh, classify these tasks in, into three categories, including the holistic uh, understanding. Uh, it, it, it requires the models to, un un to answer those uh, general questions about, uh, for example, the video summary or some uh, general like reasoning tasks. Uh, then is the single detail understanding. We 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 expect the model to uh, to find a specific detail in the videos and answer the questions based on the understanding of the specific detail, and also multi detail understanding. The model needs to find multiple details in different frames. Maybe those frames are far from each other, and they. Uh, needed to answer the question based on the understanding and of the multiple details. Here is the, uh, the performance of uh, uh, different models. We find that the, the last in the last uh, uh, rule, the in the last rule, the GPT-4 performs best. Especially, it has an average performance of sixty-four point six when it. Uh, um, Going to do like multi-choice uh, uh, selection. So uh, uh, then for the other models, they all have a uh, performance below than fifty percent. So it means that the counter there is still a large uh, uh, space for those models to improve. Okay, that's all my uh, presentation. Thank you. Any questions? Great. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. Um... There's one question uh, from Mingyan that, that he sent to me. He asked, uh, what is the training cost of the bunny model family? Oh, yeah. Uh, so for the, if we, uh, sorry. Uh, okay. If we use the Llama 3, it be as the base. It costs uh, around uh, um, like uh, one day for the pre-training and uh, um, 12 hours, uh, uh, between 12 hours and uh, one day for the fine tuning. If, if we use just the one, uh, or eight, uh, 800, eight, eight, 800 GPUs. Mm. Yeah, so, so it's very, very, uh, it's very cheap. Um, we can do it experiments with just the eight, um, eight, uh, eight, 100 uh, GPUs. Nice. Great. Uh, yeah. Any other question from the audience? Great. Yeah. I think you will just say thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I have a quick question. So for um, so you mentioned that like in terms of data sets, um it would be good to have like ideally a smaller data set or like a, a more, a better way to phrase this is that you want to have the data set of higher quality. Um, so what are some procedures to ensure the data set is of higher quality, um, especially like when you're training like large multimodal models like Bunny? Yeah, also on that, on that note, if you can talk about the 
the last oh. work that you mentioned, the, both the both the, the two work, right? The um the medical one and, and the video one, those are data set contribution, okay. right? So yeah, okay. So, uh, so you you are interested in the the medical data set? No, so I think Mark's question is pretty general, but but you oh, know, yeah, can you... as you answered, you can also talk about the okay uh, the way you like build data set for like this wide very different task, right? From from like generic and multimodal to like specific data understanding to like medical. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So for the general data set, uh, before uh, bef before I working I, I before I was working on the like uh, the data set distillation. So in data set distillation task, uh, before we uh, try to condense like uh, just the images image data sets. So we try to get uh, the very high quality image, so called high quality image data sets. And uh, we usually we select the samples uh, uh, based on the its, its distribution. For example, we 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 try to get a very uh, uh, well distributed data set, or we choose those uh, uh, centers of the clusters in a data set as the important samples. So it can be very represented. Also, we may also use like a. Um, the, the the training loss or gradients corresponding to each specific sample to to measure its importance. So here, when we construct the line two million, we use the uh, we we mainly based on its uh, um its its uh, uh, images in in the image uh emitting space. So we choose those samples uh, and based on its uh, cluster results. It's clustering, and uh, we choose the cluster centers. And, uh, other than the algorithm may be more more complex than what I descri describe, and uh, we also use uh, like a, a clip the clip score to to filter those image text pairs. Those are uh, have low sc clip scores, so we consider these are low quality. So we remove them, and uh, we also use some like. Uh, uh, some vocabulary, just vocabulary. We think be, we believe they are more important for the vision language uh, understanding tasks. Then we use the vocabulary to evaluate each training sample, each uh, question answering peers. Does it, how uh, to evaluate its uh, similarity between the vocabulary? So we we based on those uh, metrics, we 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 uh, construct this. Uh, uh, high quality data, and for fine tuning data, we uh, like do a ablation study to uh, empirically to find those, those important ones. Of course, we we also get some like, experience. For example, we still need some pure language data in the fine tuning data set. Uh, they will help keep the language model the previous uh, ability about the uh, especially it helps the uh, keep the cognition ability. So this is for the uh, general um, data set construction. Then for the sorry, for the medical data set construction, uh, you know the medical data is um, have a very uh, is 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 difficult to collect medical data because of the privacy or the a lot of problems. So we um, uh, the we call the the internet. Uh, a lot of like medical websites, open source op websites, they have some uh, CT cases and also some reports uh, written uh, written by the like uh, the doctors the, uh, and also peer reviewed online. So we collect this high quality data and then uh, based on the 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 long text reports, we use the GPT four to prompt we prompt it to generate. A, such kinds of question answering data pairs so that we can use such uh, question answering data pairs to train uh, the, this uh, MLM. Awesome. Thank you. Yep, great. I, I hope that answers your question. Um, yeah, thank you. Perfect. Great. Uh, so I think we like probably four minutes over time. So yeah, I think we can probably conclude the webinar today. Um, yeah, thanks for 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 you know your, your presentation. Very 
I think wire engine work as well, right? From uh, scaling up vision model to um, you know the bunny series, and then these two pretty new work on multi uh, medical and the data set for business standing as well. So yeah, uh, I, I started to um, I guess see some more of the work coming from the from Joy Lab at, at the Beijing Academy of AI. Uh, and yeah, and thanks Max as so well for for the first part of, uh, of the webinar with uh, uh, you know your work on TVL. I think that's uh, I think super relevant as well. Um, and thanks to the attendees for attending uh, the webinar of this of, of this. Uh, so the recording of this webinar will probably be available within the next uh, three or four weeks. And so um, yeah, once that uh, become available, I'll be sure to push on YouTube and you know let you all know that you can watch it um, later on. Yeah, with that, uh, thanks everyone, and uh, hope you have a no, good rest of your weekend. Bye-bye. Hi, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.